Welcome to the last panel of the Mayday School. We're going to be talking about the state of the agricultural sector and the differentiation of the peasant population. Here with me is Marco Lovitz, a research fellow at the Center of International Relations at the Faculty of Social Sciences, um, whose main focus of research has been alternative political economic explanations of the common agricultural policy reforms of the EU. So he'll be talking about the Slovenian agricultural production structure, the problem of class consciousness in agriculture, and, and the role of the common policy of the EU, shortly CAP. Our second panelist is Stare Kaučić, a social professor at the Biotechnical Faculty. He'll be joining us shortly. He's had some problems with his PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and the third panelist, Goran Julic from Croatia, <laughs> regretfully couldn't join us today, so the comparative perspective of Croatia will have to be left out on this occasion. So, on my part, just a short introduction on the topic of our panel and a brief sketch of the state of the agricultural sector, a sector in Slovenia. The classical Marxian conception of capital and social relations of production is premised on the separation of the producer from the means of production. Society is thus divided into a class of free but propertyless producers and a class of non-producers who own and control access to the means of production. Peasant production does not fit neatly into such a definition. The development of capitalism in agriculture has usually been predicted as a process of depeasantization, where the family farms were doomed, like all petty commodity production, to extinction. This was Kautsky's initial view and it was also Lenin's view. But this has not been the case, or at least not the whole story. The peasant production, that is one essentially based on the family farm, <coughs> and family labor was transformed and became an integral part of capitalist economy we can recognize two alternative forms of production under capitalism, I mean agricultural production. One is farming based on wage labor, and the other is a form of organizational production based on the family farm, which is incorporated into the capitalist mode of production without losing some of its substantive particularities. This second type is a form of assumption of peasant production under capital without the separation at least to some extent, of the producer from the means of production. Uh, for the purposes of today's panel, we will not be delving into the conceptual meanders of class analysis. Okay, we take it uh, that the peasantry does not constitute uh, a single class in itself. It is differentiated into classes of small-scale capitalist farmers, relatively successful petty commodity producers and wage labor. We may assume the socio-economic types and their analysis as a valuable proxy. So what is of concern to us is to provide an account of the various combinations of diverse economic activities that enable the reproduction of agricultural households and thus persistence of the peasantry to this day. In Slovenia, agriculture contributes, together with hunting and forestry, about 2% of GDP, and a bit less than 10% in terms of overall employment. Both relative shares are decreasing, and the big gap between them reveals the persisting problem of low productivity in agriculture, compared both to other branches and to the average productivity of EU, EU agriculture. So, low productivity is a result of various factors. One is unfavor unfavorable estate structure, small fragmented estates on uneven terrain. Age and education structure and low level of professionalization of production. Slovenia saw the development of a distinctive socio-economic structure where agricultural holdings that have to combine various sources of income prevail, since many of the holdings are too small to generate sufficient income from farming alone. 
So farming is mostly a supplementary activity and not a main source of income. There is only about 20% of full-time farms. Diversification and combining various sources of income are thus basic traits and survival strategies of Slovenian farms. Most of the labor is performed by family members. Hired labor is marginal. Increase, increasing portion of labor is performed by those employed outside agriculture. Main sources of income of family farms are farming, 35% of all income. Employment outside of agriculture, 30%. Social transfer, that is pensions, scholarships and child supplement support, 16%. And last of all, payments from agriculture, common agricultural politics and politics of rural development, which uh, bring 15%. The socio-economic type of farm, the types are uh, retirement farm, the combined farm, ancillary farm, and full-time farm, is an indicator of the share of income derived by family members from the basic agricultural activity. By comparing socio-economic types of farms with their economic size, measured in European size units, where one European size unit equals 1,200 euros, we see that retirement farms are economically the weakest. They are followed by ancillary and the combined time. And in Slovenia, we still have problems getting estimates of income on the farm as a whole, which would provide us with a clear picture of the state of farms as socioeconomic units. Agricultural economic analysis usually remain on the level of sectoral analysis and limit their estimates of income level solely on income from farming. So perhaps uh, Stane will expand on that. Um, what remains unclear is how these socioeconomic types correspond with uh, Lenin's classes of peasants. Petty commodity production and by analogy peasantry in capitalism combines class locations of capital, that is land tools, seeds, and labor. Family farm, which is a form of consumption of peasant production under capital without the separation of the producer from the means of production, can be further differentiated. For this purpose, we can invoke Lenin's tripartite differentiation of peasantry and thus see how we could start complementing social economic analysis with a more stricto sensu class analysis. Lenin's rich peasants are the ones who accumulate productive assets and reproduce themselves on a larger scale, engaging in expanded reproduction. They are the emergent capitalist farmers. The middle peasants are involved in simple reproduction of themselves as capital and labor. The poor or small peasants are struggling to reproduce themselves and are locked in what we could call a simple reproduction squeeze. All of them may resort to diversification of income, but this diversification is not unequivocal. Emergent capitalist farmers diversify to accumulate. They invest in activities ancillary to farming, like crop trading and processing, renting draft animals and tractors, they invest in land and so on. Medium-scale farmers will combine farming with off-farm activities, including labor migration as a source of income to help reproduce farm production. But they also hire wage labor to replace family labor engaged in off-farm activities or to augment family labor at moments of peak demand, like harvesting. So, um, I think it would be interesting to cross-reference data on, first of all, socio-economic types. Secondly, on total income of agricultural households and on relative shares of different sources of income. And thirdly, on types of off-farm activities. So, to get back, before EU accession, concerns were raised that the average Slovenian agricultural holding or farm will not be able to survive. And the 
that the only solution to the problem of competitiveness was to support the development of large, full-time and market-oriented farms. Have these predictions turned out to be accurate? How did the entry into the EU and its CAP affect the socio-economic structure of agriculture? What is the position of Slovenian farms today? Did the CAP accentuate or mitigate the internal differentiation of the socio-economic structure? What are the principles of their differentiation of income? What changes may be observed in the past years? So, at this point, I'd like to uh, give the microphone to Marco Lovitz. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the title of my presentation is Slovene Agriculture Production Structure, the Problem of Class Consciousness in Agriculture and the Role of the European Union's Common Agriculture Policy. There are basically three groups of issues faced by agriculture in modern developed countries. First, availability of sufficient supply or the issue of the food security. Secondly, efficient organization of production structures and efficient employment of production factors. And thirdly, the problem of goods which are closely tied to agricultural production, such as sustainable land and water management, preservation of biodiversity, and so on. At least as far as the first two issues are concerned, Slovenia is no example, but in fact faces greater problems than its more developed neighbors. The reasons can be found in general characteristics of agricultural production, and in particular position of Slovene agriculture in the EU. And I think that Marxist analysis can contribute to the explanation of both general and particular problems of Slovene agriculture. Although my mentor tells me that this is a very brave thesis for someone who tries to survive in this business. <laughs> yeah. My presentation will be structured into three parts. First, I will discuss general problems of agriculture in the, and the opportunities for Marxist analysis. Secondly, I will discuss the particular characteristics of Slovene agriculture. I will, speak, I will basically stick to some of the general observations which I find important, but I'm sure my colleague will correct me if necessary, since I believe he's a specialist in micro and macro efficiency of uh, Slovene agriculture. And thirdly, I will discuss the policy opportunities within the framework of the European Union's common agriculture policy. So to begin with the conceptual issues in modern political economy of agriculture, there are basically two classical issues. The problem of family farm and the problem of price fluctuations. The dominant organization model in modern agriculture is family farm which means that production factors such as land and capital are owned by half of the family and the family members represent the main labor force. There are two problems which are related with family farms. First is the overutilization of production factors such as too big investments in production means too much labor work. The second is underutilization of production factors. For example, labor maximizing specializations, which basically means that there is too much work for too little effort or too little money. It is believed that both of the problems are due to double function of farmers, which are both land and capital owners and laborers. Other reasons are historically fragmented, la fragmented la land ownership, lower education levels, lack of career opportunities in rural areas, fixed investments, or the so-called problem of disinvestment. The second problem, the second classical problem, the problem of price fluctuations, refers to temporal limitations of price elasticity. Farmers adapt to high prices by producing more. However, by the time the product reaches the market, the price might have already gone down, which means that their business behavior is pro-cyclical. 
<coughs> and besides these two classical problems, there are two more contemporary issues related with agriculture. These are the so-called joint products and food security. Particular types of agricultural production are related with provision of public goods, such as land management, preservation of biodiversity, of cultural heritage, and so on. 80% of the areas in the European Union are covered by agricultural lands and forests. Agriculture contributes substantial, substantial, substantial share of greenhouse gas emissions and is important polluter of waters. Public goods are goods which are not excludable and or unlimited in scope. In case they are unexcludable, which means that they cannot be owned, there is a tendency of overuse. This phenomenon is known as a tragedy of the commons. In case they are unlimited, which means that they are club goods, it makes sense to collect club members. In both cases, the state should be the one who defines the right price of these goods, either limit supply or, or uses taxpayers' money to set the right demand. In cases when opportunity costs exist, meaning that there is a discrepancy between tendency to maximize profits and tendency to maximize provision of public goods, state either has to re regulate practices or compensate farmers for provision of club goods. Food security can be considered as a public good since the lack of supply can have detrimental consequences for the society. <clears throat> and now, is there a place for a Marxist analysis? I'm confident that there is. First, there is a problem of weak market power. With agriculture, we have perfect market conditions. We have homogeneous goods, many suppliers, and constant innovation. The historical data demonstrates that there is basically a 2% annual increase in production. The perfect market conditions create perfect problems, <coughs> constant pressure on investments, which leads to self-exploiting practices or partial integration of farmers into markets. Thus, industry did not need to enter agricultural production at all, but could easily make a living by specializing in inputs, credit, retail, and merchandise. More recently, the so-called livestock consumerism has reached the farm. People want to buy unprocessed and local food. However, average farmer still gets little out of it compared with extra costs paid by the consumer. Secondly, there is the agricultural policy problem. Since the number of farmers is small and they are well organized, agricultural policies are considered to benefit them substantially. The, the reality is a bit different. Policies only benefit big farmers and production factor owners, such as landowners. And farming-related industry, when the average laborers in agriculture still receive under average salaries, and small farmers are pressured out of business. Furthermore, the relation between supports and new objectives, such as environment, as well as the whole issue of self-sufficiency, is extremely problematic. These two objectives in practice create landlords and serve, serve as an excuse of new mercantilist strategies. Consumers and taxpayers face huge information asymmetry. We are in fact facing a capture of public policy by private interests. <clears throat> now, the second issue, the second big topic of my presentation, the Slovene agricultural production structure. For the reasons explained, I will only discuss this issue briefly, since we have the privilege to be able to listen to the expert in this period. Average Slovene production unit, that is farm, is relatively small. Most of the farms are a family-run business. A lot of farms are engaged in production of mixed products. Farmers are relatively old and undereducated. Average income from farm farming is small. Majority of the farms fail to meet expected EU-level productivity objectives. There are a lot of part-time farmers. 
We can speak of over and underutilization of factors, either too big or insufficient investments, labor maximization strategies, and self exploitation. The specific reasons for underdeveloped structures lie first, historical fragmentation of land ownership, repair of the status of our region during the Industrial Revolution, secondly, agricultural policy during the Yugoslav regime, which was against the big privately owned business, and thirdly, the situation following the independence, which was defined by disintegration of supply chains, especially with the high value added products such as meat industry, external competitive pressures from heavily subsidized EU farmers, general economic crisis, high prices of imported inputs, and so on. And finally, the situation is due to the EU membership and the role of the European Union's common agricultural policy. And this is the third, the third topic of my presentation, so <clears throat> the European Union's common agricultural policy. The European Union's common agricultural policy was created in order to protect farmers in the European economic community from external pressures and as a compensation for France, who was a big agricultural producer. In the 80s, the European economic community faced overproduction and growing policy costs, which triggered the McSherry reform, the 1992 reform, which replaced part of price supports with direct payments to farmers. Soon after, the Uruguay Round Agreement on Agriculture was signed, in, I think in 1994, the trade agreement constrained the scope of trade distorting measures. The second half of the 90s saw the beginning of accession negotiations with Central and Eastern European countries, including Slovenia. Due to lower support levels, we were expected to become beneficiaries of common agricultural policy. In 1999, the Agenda 2000 reform further replaced price supports with direct payments, so that internal prices were now close to the world levels. In 2002, it was agreed that expenditures on CAP would not grow anymore. Direct payments would be only gradually phased in to the new member states. They would apply simplified area payments schemes. We were granted general structural supports. In 2003, the so-called Fisher reform decoupled supports from production, which basically means that farmers were no longer required to produce in order to receive direct payments, and introduced modulation, which transferred 5% of direct payments for co-financing of rural development programs. And in 2008, the so-called Health Check reform further increased modulation to 10% and introduced degressive capping, which is a mechanism that transfers 4% of individual payments that are higher than 300,000 euros uh, for co-financing of the rural development programs. This enabled to reduce financial pressures since rural development supports were co-financed from national budgets. Last year, Agreement on new multi annual financial framework or the long term budget of the EU for the period 2014 2020 and the CAP reform was made. CAP budget was slightly cut. Green reform, on the other hand, introduced regional per area payments which were partially converged. They will become more equal. In case of larger farmers, Payments will be, will be conditioned upon environmental measures, by upon preservation of permanent pastures, crop diversification, and introduction of so-called ecological focus areas. Member states will be able to redistribute part of the funds to small farmers and switch funds between the two pillars, between the direct payments pillar and the rural development support pillar. What are the main problems of the European Union's common agricultural policy? Payments are increasingly capitalized on land. They benefit big landowners and extensive systems. In spite of redistribution schemes, social impact of supports is limited. Supports are based on ownership of land and capital, 
not on the uh, engagement of labor. Payments have negative structural effects. They inhibit production-oriented structural development. Even though the level of support for farmers in new member states was, it was increased, they are still receiving less money than farmers from old new member states. Since average farm is smaller, farmer also gets less funds. Funds did not enable for sufficient restructuring and investment in production capacities in new member states. The recent reform demonstrates that the reduction of funds was stronger for the new member states, which is a consequence of strength of all member states as contributors to the budget. In return, flexibilities to switch funds was increased. However, this will harm rural development programs. New member states are expected to increase their per area payments by drawing from these rural development supports, which would which will benefit subsidy farmers, but uh, would uh, hinder the future of the rural development programs. Because rural development programs require for national co-financing, so the new member states would most probably rather decide to go with the supports that don't require these funds. Okay, to conclude these problems, at least in my opinion, demonstrate that there is a place for Marxist analysis. How about Marxist theory-based policy? We have identified three problems. Inefficient production structures, weak market power, and bad policy, together with information asymmetry, or the so-called state capture by the private interests. I see opportunity in A, cooperatives, which would improve the efficiency in employment of means of production. B, supports for social entrepreneurship in agriculture through subsidies for leases of private and state-owned land. C, long-term contracting with local suppliers in all public institutions. D, strengthened organization of product producers and improved certification standards so that it is clear where and how the unprocessed food was produced. E, development of methods for direct sell to final consumers through online platforms and in public markets. F, public investments in development of new sustainable methods, farming technologies and certification standards. And finally, a real common agricultural policy reform. This would mean better definition and better targeting of public goods, changing current direction away from per area payments towards rural development programs, towards investments in knowledge, sustainable technology, and infrastructure. Thank you. So, um, I'll, ask, I'll ask the second panelist, Sanya Kaucic, to present a talk on the size structure of the agricultural holdings and their importance for Slovenian food balance. Thank you. I came here without any material. I had some problems today, but uh, this is not... Uh, uh, I, I will try to just to raise some points for a later discussion. Uh, as uh, Marco already told you, I am a microeconomist. Uh, working on biotechnical faculty and I am also uh, working on family farm so I have some experiences what's going on in real life uh, maybe we, you will not agree with me but uh, this is a good day to discuss later on uh, first of all I would like to stress some uh, um, some uh, uh, figures about uh, uh, the structure of Slovenian farms in economic terms. Uh, we have approximately 60,000 family farms that annually apply for direct payments. Uh, this Farm, these family farms 
and also uh, maybe tw uh, 200 uh, uh, bigger enterprises uh, have some uh, market power. Uh, they uh, produce uh, some food for the market, but uh, approximately uh, 35,000 of these farms produce the value of uh, output per year less than 8,000 euros. These are, uh, these are uh, official estimates. Uh, we have no, uh, no data about uh, their income, uh, only the value of production uh, uh, in terms of standard output. Uh, then uh, we have only approximately seven to eight thousand farms uh, that uh, have standard output more than twenty-five thousand euros. Standard output, not income. And uh, with these figures, we see that uh, our uh, farms are very fragmented. They uh, may maybe we have. Uh, 500 or uh, at the best uh, 1,000 farms, which really uh, have uh, quite good economic situation on their farms, uh, but difficult we can talk that we have maybe 5,000 5, farms which are which have uh, some development prospects and. In this situation, it's difficult to, to talk how to organize to have uh, more, uh, more efficient uh, agriculture, uh, to have better, um, better, um, better situation in terms uh, of uh, motivation to work to produce food, uh, since we know that. Uh, also, Marco and uh, Gregor spent previously that uh, currently uh, direct payments, but also uh, important share of rural development payments uh, in Slovenia uh, are payments uh, tied for ownership. They are really uh, rent for ownership of the land. Not uh, they are not. Uh, payments for uh, uh, pr pr production or not, and also not uh, to, I am quite sure, not to, uh, to, uh, for public goods. Uh, maybe this situation is uh, quite difficult to explain, but uh, uh, in uh, Slovenia we have uh, from year to year uh, lower production of uh, food self-sufficiency is going down. Uh, we have uh, the reason for this is uh, non uh, non competitive agricultural structure. But uh, also, uh, I am quite sure that our uh, agricultural measures in Slovenia are not uh, efficient and subject to what they. What it is uh, uh, in uh, written on uh, on strategic papers or something like that. Uh, in Slovenia, we have very bad situation in, in uh, production of cereals, in production of uh, corn, in production of uh, poultry. The situation is a little bit better, but is based on imported uh, forage. Uh, we have a very small, uh, small uh, arable uh, land uh, per capita. Uh, we have uh, some policy targets that uh, the situation will be improved in some years. We will have some couple payments uh, to increase uh, serious production in Slovenia, uh, but uh, if we take, um, take into, took into account uh, the real uh, natural resources we have uh, available, I see
think that uh, uh, we have no prospects to increase uh, this situation. Uh, I am quite sure that uh, better results could be achieved if uh, we, um, we uh, would try to increase uh, production of uh, food with higher um, value added uh, per, uh, <coughs> per unit of uh, land, uh, like fruit production, like, like vegetables, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, since we have uh, two thirds of uh, agricultural land uh, with uh, permanent grassland, uh, the situation uh, and the prospects for uh, further increases. Uh, most of all in, uh, in uh, cattle in smaller ruminant production. But uh, in all uh, this uh, need better organization uh, in uh, input and uh, also in uh, market organization of producers. Uh, the topic for today should be more sociological. One, uh, I am not uh, working in this field, uh, but uh, for me, every time somebody mentioned alternatives, <coughs> I, I would like to to see some other uh, some other. Uh, In Slovenia, uh, everything seems that uh, we, ha we have quite good uh, cooperatives, uh, but uh, I'm quite sure that again uh, these cooperatives work uh, in favor only for uh, the big farms. They have uh, quite uh, th their opinion is the one uh, that is. Uh, um, that is uh, taken into account in any decisions in, uh, in cooperatives, but uh, small farmers have no uh, option to have any, um, any um, <laughs> yeah, to have any impact on uh, uh, what's going on in co uh, Slovenian cooperatives. Uh, for me, this is a huge, a huge problem. Maybe the, the, the most important one at the moment. Uh, we usually think that we have uh, non-government organizations like the Agricultural Chamber, like uh, Farmers Union and so on. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, better, uh, uh, better uh, situation, uh, better income situation on, uh, uh, on the rural areas, uh, the organization uh, of farmers is more important than any other issue, I think. Uh, maybe I will not continue now. Uh, I, I, um, here for the first time, I did not know how this will go on, but uh, I am quite sure that uh, we will have a very inter interesting uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, it's better to have more time for that. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Marco and Stara. And now I open the time for debate. So, are there any questions? Agriculture is not something that we, uh, Marxist, 
uh, talk about very often, uh, but we should. Uh, well, um, I have many questions, but uh, maybe let's start with one. I can see that there is a big problem of power um, within the organizations of, of the peasants or of the farmers. You are talking about uh, uh, agricultural policy being influenced by larger farmers. Uh, you're talking about uh, their interest being reflected in the common European agricultural policy. And uh, uh, the, 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 the last speaker also mentioned the, that uh, the cooperatives that we some, sometimes uh, think of as being more democratic form of, of uh, association are also divided or are also uh, run by uh, stronger, larger farmers. And now, uh, when you were speaking about this problem, I was, I got an idea and maybe we can discuss it. I'm not saying it's, it's a good idea, but this is what came to my mind when you were speaking about this problem. It is, uh, why wouldn't we try with a new type of uh, cooperatives? Why, if we know that large farmers rich farmers, as many said, uh, have too much saying in the existing cooperatives. Why don't we move with cooperatives that would, per se, have limitation, like, you know, a maximum on land ownership? They would say, okay, if you have land, more than 10 acres of land, then you cannot be a member of this type of, of um, cooperative. And this would not be anti-democratic. This would be, uh, on the contrary, a democratic measure, because it would mean that people with equal power would, and uh, similar interest would be gathered in a cooperative. You know? So no one would be able, or no one would have the objective uh, need to enforce interests that would be uh, different than the interests of other, of, of other people. So the idea is have the limitation on who can join the cooperative, because cooperative has a certain mission. This mission is not to promote the interest of those who are already strong, but to, but to organize those who are weak uh, uh, in, in, in relation to their suppliers on the market and in relation to their consumers or the people who are intermediaries between them and their consumers. So, okay, that would be my, my, my comment. If this was the question for me, uh, I, yeah, okay. uh, I, I will try uh, one uh, viewpoint. Uh, in, in Slovenia, I, I think uh, we have in situation that uh, people are not very motivated to organize themselves. Uh, or maybe they have a problem uh, how to start with this. Uh, we have uh, existing cooperatives which have power, which have uh, uh, possibility to be everywhere, to uh, uh, have uh, their vote in uh, every uh, every uh, in uh, for example uh, at the Ministry of Agriculture when, when they are when the Ministry have uh, uh, the meeting of uh, the board of uh, government organizations and so on uh, nobody is uh, or nobody from this uh, cooperatives want to have uh, somebody which will try to work on this field except them, them. Uh, and uh, the, the small farmers uh, they I think uh, they they don't have uh, enough, uh, they are not well enough maybe uh, to, to start 
to uh, to organize themselves uh, to help with initial uh, initial uh, organs uh, which uh, will uh, work in this field. I, I'm not uh, I'm not sure why uh, we we came in this situation. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, that uh, at the moment uh, very small numbers of uh, the farmers which are not the, the biggest one uh, have idea how to start in this field. I think also the problem was that uh, the cooperatives did not have these internal mechanisms, which is, I think, the reason or the source where uh, the disillusionment of the peasants stems from. There was no immediate mechanisms like one share, one vote, uh, which is being propagated recently in the smaller cooperatives that still have to gain some prominence. But this is a new practice as, as far as I no, this field, no? These are conditional principles of cooperatives, but at the moment they doesn't work, I think so. Yeah. And also, there was no limit uh, as to whether, as to how much uh, land or mm -hmm. I don't know, animals one can have. Mm -hmm. so, so the cooperatives were not limited to small size farmers no. and to medium size farmers. Yeah, these are only big organizations, organizations either, so they are easily captured by uh, certain groups of small farmers. But since the 80s, there's been differentiation of uh, uh, the farmers' organizations on the new level. The small farmers got organized, new uh, organizations emerged, which were depending on the interest of the small farmer, farmers' groups. And uh, the role of this uh, <coughs> new farmers organizations such as, for example, the Via Campesina has been strengthening during the last 20 years, but nevertheless the impact of these organizations on the, on the common agriculture, agriculture policy has been limited. Through the reforms, various mechanisms were introduced, the so-called redistribution, redistribution mechanisms which, uh, uh, which enable member states to to pay small farmers fixed amounts of money, but these are still very small amounts, a couple of thousand euros and so on, two thousand euros, one thousand five hundred euros, five hundred euros per farm. So uh, this, uh, the, the influence, the impact of uh, this new type of farmers' organizations has been extremely limited. Um, how do I see the potential of cooperatives? It's, I think it's very simple. You have small farmers with small pieces of land, and the farmer cannot, uh, it's not rational for him to loan money to invest in production technology because he only has this small piece of land. He cannot pay off this investment. So he makes some arrangement with other farmers who has who have small pieces of land and they do it together. They buy the equipment together. They use the equipment together. I see this as kind of grassroots uh, organization of cooperatives, which follows a certain economic project. Now why does this this does happen. Uh, I think that in Slovenia we're also facing a kind of uh, new generation of organizations in agriculture, but this is, uh, it, it's in an early stage. The ecologic farmers, the urban farmers and so on, which are being organized in a way, which share ideas, technology, access to consumers and so on. Why does this not happen on the larger scale, on the national level? On the average farmer is old. Average farmer is under under educated. Average farmer is trapped in a 
Kafka, traditional way of thinking. His children uh, doesn't, don't want to continue to, to practice a farm. They want to go to the city. They want to have uh, other jobs. Uh, the system, the agricultural policy, uh, hinders the structural development, hinders the, the way of thinking that uh, agriculture should be developed, that we should cooperate and so on. Because it gives uh, subsidies to the landowners, which means that the uh, land prices increase. So it's hard for a younger farmer to start business. It's hard for someone who is young to say, I will start business in agriculture because he cannot afford to buy land, he cannot afford to buy equipment. Do you, in a way, is aware of the problem and uh, supports young farmers as specific mechanisms to support young farmers, but to me, to be a young farmer means to be uh, under 40. That's this strange definition. There are many strange things about you and Captain mechanisms. So in a way, you create the problem by giving the per area based payments, by subsidizing landowners, and on the other hand, it, uh, it recognizes the problem and it gives a little bit of support to young farmers. In practical terms, this means that the younger farmer, some of his under 40, receives a bit higher per area payment. But what does that mean for you as a young farmer? If you receive instead of, I don't know, 300 euros per uh, hectare, if you receive 350 euros per hectare, what does this mean for someone who is deciding like whether to buy five or 10 hectares of land? Any other questions? So I have one um, for Sarah. Um, how much did the second pillar, uh, the rural, the rural development pillar, affect the diversification of income? Did it lead to new stable uh, employment opportunities, and what are its effects on the agrarian and social economic structure? <clears throat> the story of the second pillar is uh, it's complicated, it's not black and white. Structural supports emerged relatively early. They emerged uh, in the 60s. Uh, at first, these were funds for early retirement, for modernization, uh, to buy new equipment, and so on. And slowly, through the years, to the, dec to the decades, the scope of these funds uh, increased. The first, the idea of the first uh, commissioner for agriculture, C. Comensal, was to have a market-based agriculture with structural funds, with structural supports. Uh, France and Germany opposed this idea because we had a large number of these relatively less uh, competitive uh, farmers who were afraid that they would uh, either be pressured by more competitive uh, uh, Dutch farmers, farmers from Netherlands, or that the money, the sub subsidies will go to the Italian farmers where the structural conditions were the worst. In spite of these fears, these fears, the structure of funds actually went to more developed countries. In practice, most of the structural funds were, uh, were used uh, by uh, German farmers. And um, through the decades, uh, when the, the the importance, the role of the structural funds uh, strengthened. This did not change, in spite of the fact that uh, uh, Spain and uh, Greece and Portugal entered the EU in the 80s, and in spite of the fact that uh, in 2004, 10 new member states uh, entered the EU. 
actually the situation, what is the reason? What, why did the structure funds, did not, why did they did not uh, improve the, the structure? Why did the funds not go to the countries where the structures are the least developed? First of all, uh, these funds require for national code finance. So the country needs to provide its own financial resources. Secondly, these funds require for uh, programs, for specific programs, development programs. And to have such programs, you need the knowledge, you need the infrastructure, you need farmers to know what, uh, what kind of investments they would like to go into, uh, who have uh, business plans, and so on. And um, to give you an example, when uh, Poland entered the EU, majority of Polish farmers did not even hold a bank account. So, how to use structural development funds in a situation where majority of farmers does not even hold a bank account? The role of these funds was systematically strengthened after the 2003 official reform with the, it's called the modulation mechanism which takes part of the direct payments, first it was 5% and then 10%, and gives this, uh, gives this money to the rural development pillar, the second pillar, and then the money is used for co-financing of the uh, rural development uh, programs. But this mechanism was in fact uh, applied in order to reduce pressure on the direct payments because direct payments were being phased into the new member states after the 2004 and because of that the, pro the pressure on the upper limit of the direct payments was increasing and they, they set the upper limit in 2002 because they were afraid that new member states would become beneficiaries would take uh, more and more money from the common agricultural policy and that they will be uh, that the production powers would be rebalanced so they set this uh, financial limit and in order to respect this limit they took more and more money from the uh, direct payments pillar and uh, for the general public it seemed as as if this money was now used for structural problems for new member states but in practice most of the money went to developed countries because they were able to co-finance the rural development programs. Now, in terms of how the money is used in Slovenia and how does it, uh, how the, do the rural development programs affect the differentiation in Slovenian agriculture, I think that the situation is more or less uh, it's similar to the situation on the EU level. Only some of the farmers benefit, the big farmers, the farmers who have information, who have access. But most of the farmers and, uh, do not benefit from these funds. And the, the, the main, the center of structural problems remain unresolved. And of course, there are a lot of uh, absurd situations. Uh, uh, I think that the farmer from Denmark got world development funds to build a ski resort on his farmland and so on. And these absurd situations are then picked up <coughs> by the media during the reforms. They were picked up during the recent reform and they enabled decision makers to do big, to, to make big cuts into rural development fund. And by making these big cuts to the fund, they disabled the continuation of many very important development problems in terms of uh, environmental concerns, uh, improvement of infrastructure, so, so the, the situation is not very well. Okay. Hey, I have one comment. In Slovenia, uh, under this second pillar, uh, we have uh, quite a uh, huge amount for investment support, but uh, uh, also for uh, provision of public goods in terms of public environmental and payments and payments for agriculture and rest-favored uh, areas. And uh, this
So you both mentioned inequalities stemming from mm -hmm. the agricultural subsidies. Do you think uh, these inequalities generate conflict, conflicts among the peasants uh, of varying sizes? Uh, um, questions. Uh, the first one is uh, more non-systematical. And uh, so in capitalism, when you want to be competitive, you actually have two possibilities in agriculture. One is to intensify your farming or uh, to, to go to uh, bio-agriculture. And since in Slovenia we have smaller farmers, uh, maybe this would be uh, the more the, the, be, the more appropriate approach, uh, and I would like to know what you think about it. Uh, and also, uh, if not, uh, what would be the bigger the biggest problems uh, when turning into uh, bio bio agriculture? Uh, is that lack of knowledge, uh, uh, the age, or? problems because um, uh, now in Slovenia we have uh, Zeleni Zapojčak, probably you heard of it. Uh, so it's a kind of organization that connects farmers uh, uh, with uh, bioagriculture and uh, I've heard people actually queue for a year or more so they could order uh, that kind of uh, uh, bio food. <laughs> Um, and uh, the second question would be, um, maybe it's, it's actually quite naive, but if you would like to organize farmers, what do you think, how do you think you, you should approach them? Because you're dealing with them in everyday life, so uh, probably the, this traditional thinking, as, as far as I would say would be the most uh, bigger problem if you wanted to talk with them because um, 
I forget, uh, as far as I know, uh, farmers usually think uh, they are just some hippies that want to tell us what to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, won't, I won't listen to them, it's just a crack. So, what do you think about this? <laughs> Yes, I agree. Uh, the first idea you have is to intensify. And they actually taught the decision makers for thinking, thinking in that way, in that direction, after the Second World War. Because smart farms were relatively small in Europe. Uh, they said then we will support the investments in capital intensive equipment, machinery, means, and we will intensify. But uh, this model, the, the model of uh, hyper intensification of production, uh, is the crisis in the 80s. The problem with agricultural products is that there is a limited demand for these products. Each of us can eat 2,000 or perhaps 3,000 calories, but after that, you don't want extra food. And on the other hand, uh, we have a constant technological progress in agriculture. The pr productivity increases amazingly. It's an amazingly fast increase in productivity. So the intensification is not uh, the right answer. It produced many, many problems. Well, it did provide for a uh, stable supply of food. It did pro provide uh, for uh, lower prices of food, uh, which was important after the Second World War, but in terms of, uh, of a solution for agricultural producers, it was not a good answer. It, um, it basically hindered the development of the whole world's uh, regions, the underdeveloped, the, the uh, South America, the Africa, so this model had many negative uh, externalities. So since the 80s, they, they, the, the turn, there was a turn in thinking, away from quantity towards quality. They were thinking in terms, what does the farmer provide to the society, apart from the, the simple raw commodity. So it was no longer about uh, food, cheap food, but it was about uh, animal welfare, it was about the traditional look of the countryside, it was about biodiversity, uh, this kind of rom romantic uh, image of European farmer was being built, slowly built, and it uh, legitimized the new kind of policy, which, is, um, which has basically two directions. On one hand, it still supports intensive producers, they still uh, use the money they get, these direct payments, in order to reinvest, to buy new equipment, to intensify. But on the other hand, it uh, hinders the development of production capacities. Since many farmers receive payments but uh, are not required to farm at all, since the land prices of uh, land grow and so on. So, on the other hand, we have concentration, intent, con concentration and intensification of production. And on the other hand, we have uh, the preservation of status quo, the preservation of uh, production structures. Now, how to approach farmers? The third question, your third question. I think you have to be a farmer. There is no <laughs> third way. In the first uh, step, you will uh, expand the European model of agriculture, but uh, probably this is not the anyone uh, which will uh, go on in the future. Uh, we still have uh, the problem of uh, hunger in the world. We will have the, this problem probably also in Europe again. I think so. We have. Uh, the problem of uh, living standard, uh, poor, poor living standard uh, in Slovenia also. I, I 
think uh, that uh, uh, we will uh, have again uh, some solutions you explained uh, before that uh, the small farmers will have to intensify uh, the, the practice on their small uh, pieces of land uh, if they uh, have no other job they will have to uh, work something which is labor intensive, not, not capital intensive, uh, and to produce as much as possible uh, to have uh, to achieve as high income as possible on this uh, person of land uh, it has available. Uh, we, we have a very difficult situation also in Slovenia and uh, in uh, uh, Europe or uh, in the world. Uh, we didn't uh, talk today about the problems which uh, bring the globalization, uh, which uh, uh, have uh, very negative impacts uh, on uh, small farms. Uh, maybe this is not the issue for today, but uh, I think uh, everybody here uh, is not uh, very happy what's going on, uh, and uh, we we we, are, we know that uh, something will help to, to change in near future, not uh, not in the generation which will uh, be, be very uh, in in in, uh, in in this century, not, not later, but uh, maybe in the next. Uh, I wanted to ask about the cooperatives you mentioned. Did they uh, did some of them actually existed during socialism, and how was uh, arable land uh, organized before '89? And the other question is if they, if, because in Bulgaria we had this huge cooperative movement even before socialism, but then by the end of the '50s we already had like 3,000 cooperatives. Um, so, if there were uh, some cooperatives, uh, what, what happened to their land after that? Was it some <coughs> deep restitute? I'm too young to remember, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> try to, to give you a sort of an answer, though I'm not, I'm not sure it's really uh, an accurate one. Um, we have to distinguish uh, between uh, a cooperative and what was maybe called a cooperative, but was actually more like a Soviet kolkhoz. Uh, as far as I know, there was in Bulgaria after the Second World War a collectivization more or less of the Soviet type, whereas in Yugoslavia this practice was uh, it was put forward uh, after 45, but it was then the party decided not to go through it. So in Slovenia or in, in general in Yugoslavia, uh, the, the, the agricultural sector could be divided, let's say, in two parts. One was the state-owned part, the one uh, operated by larger estates, firms, agricultural firms, uh, working on the confiscated land. Okay? Uh, if Now, those companies, those socially or state-owned companies, were then, we were just discussing that with, with Gregor a couple of days ago, uh, were dismantled or privatized like, like, uh, like other state or socially owned companies. Okay? It is an interesting question, but that sector was not very large in Slovenia. On the other hand, you had um, peasant farms, small farms, because there was a maximum limit of how much land uh, you can own, let's say 10 uh, acres. 
uh, and uh, and uh, those peasants did organize in cooperatives, uh, but those were, let's say, uh, cooperatives of a uh, of a classical type, not Soviet type of course. Okay, so uh, those uh, cooperatives more or less survived, and they faced the problems probably even then. Uh, that uh, Stane just uh, described. These are basically cooperatives that you can find, let's say, in Tsarist Russia. There was a large co cooperative movement. Or you can find it everywhere in, in Western Europe. So I think this, uh, so, you know, there was a different situation in, in, in Bulgaria and Yugoslavia in this, in this respect. There was no collective uh, sector uh, in strict sense in, in, in Yugoslavia, I would say.